Around month nine or ten of the pandemic, I noticed that a bunch of my friends and internet associates had started to read the same book. It was called Wintering, The Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times. Of course, I had to get myself a copy. And imagine my delight at discovering that the author of this internationally best-selling book, Catherine May, was an autistic woman roughly my age. Not only that, but her first book, The Electricity of Every Living Thing, was all about her autistic journey of self-discovery. I can't say enough about Catherine's autism memoir. As I consumed it, I felt like I was reading about myself, which is both unsettling and thrilling. I dog-eared so many pages and sung the book's praises to everyone I knew. So how could I not try everything in my power to get Catherine on the horn? Luckily, she answered. Hello, I'm Catherine May. I'm the author of Wintering and the Electricity of Every Living Thing. And I've known I'm autistic for about five years now. You know, one one thing you wrote that, that um, you know, when you were sort of in these early stages that you felt like you were trying to perform some kind of acrobatic act of understanding and seeing yourself from the outside. And I wonder, like, I mean, that's such a beautiful way of describing it. But, like, tell me more about what that means about that experience of yeah. of really trying to, like, turn yourself over. <laughs> yeah. And look at it from a different from look at yourself from a different perspective. Mm, and and things that were maybe invisible to me. Yeah, and that's because so many of the accounts of autism, again, particularly at the time, were all from the outside. They were all like, what does an autistic person look like to a neurotypical person? Mm-hmm. You know, what are the signs, like what are the symptoms, which is, you know, a word that I'm very, very right. uncomfortable with using. Um, of autism you know and so it's like it looks like this they will seem socially awkward they will you know they will not be making eye contact but da 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 um and so what I had to do was think well do, do I fit those descriptions you know do I refuse to make eye contact and and then that opens up this whole personal archaeology because actually yes I can remember being very very uncomfortable with eye contact when I was younger and being told off for it, you know, being told off for not paying attention and not looking at someone while they were addressing me, you know, mm. by teachers and stuff like that. Um, but I'd I'd buried so much because I had no consistent narrative of self available to me that would have integrated all that I was. Like there was no story that I could have told myself in which. I was a kind of valued, accepted autistic person. Mm-hmm. And so I'd constructed a self in my mind that was like a kind of slightly wonky neurotypical who <laughs> seemed traumatized, but, but couldn't remember what the trauma, you know, like had no access to, to knowing what this trauma was supposed to be. Um, and that I, if I could only find the right answer, you know, so I was always like reading self-help books and going to workshops, you know, and, mm. and taking up new things that, that would sort me out, that would finally make me operate in the same way as the people around me did. And in the meantime, I was engaged in a big project of pretending I was just like them. And in fact, that I was a hyper normal one like them, you know. Right. Um, and so, I mean, I, I don't know if it's the same for you, but it it becomes this huge mission to unravel all that you thought you knew about yourself and to actually get back to contact with how you feel in the world you know Mm. and and I'd suppressed a lot of sensory stuff that I didn't think I had the right to feel Mm -hmm. and so I had to reacquaint with all of that it was it was slow and it was painful yeah yeah no I mean I I I like I said, you know, we started, I mean, everything that I was reading in your book, I was like, yes, 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 that's me, that's me. I've I've always, you know, it's like Lauren, uh, you know, uh, dances to the beat of her, her own drummer, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like that type of yeah, person, right? Yeah. And it's like, but w- the way that you talked about your your childhood, I mean, I I felt very, very much the same. Like you're a handful. You're difficult. <laughs> you. I wanted to talk to you about your temper mm, as a kid, mm. and 
And I guess like what that looked like when you were a child. Yeah. And I mean, I think probably now what I was going through would have been described as meltdowns. Mm. But again, because there was no access to that language, mm-hmm. um, I was, you know, seen as a yeah, a, a child with a temper who who could kind of fly off the handle and who, you know, was was naughty and difficult. Um, and what I remember is being disapproved of by adults for losing control and feeling very Mm -hmm. different in that sense like very very much like a like somebody who was who did not have control of their behavior in the way that other children did and and wondering how other children managed to pull off this amazing feat of, of control yeah right right the issue is I mean do you think that your parents had an inkling like Oh, yeah. there's something beyond just Catherine being difficult or sensitive. Mm. And you know what? I think because I, I I was brought up by my mum because my parents were divorced. But I would say uh, uh-huh. that my mum was absolutely clear that there was something going on. She, I mean, and she's as soon as mm-hmm. I told her as an adult, she was like, "Oh, yes, that's it," you know. And she'd she'd right. fought battles to try and get it understood. You know, she she saw loads of things that were running differently to me and other kids. And, you know, there was a there was a while when my school kind of suggested that I was what would have been called hyperactive at the time. You know, we'd now talk about ADHD, but you know, I was right. a hyperactive child. But that didn't particularly fit and it it didn't fit my academic profile necessarily as well, because it was really obvious that I, you know, could concentrate very deeply on academic things, uh-huh. but that my more erratic behaviour was often around sport and social events and, and that and you know those those things that I found really difficult so yeah mm-hmm. like my mum my mum knew there was something but there was she had nothing and she actually rang me after the book came out and to say there was no there was nothing that could have led me to to this you know mm-hmm. do you forgive mm-hmm. me and I was like of course I do I totally understand oh, you know that's beautiful she wanted to help and she knew I needed it um, and yeah. uh, you know, there there was nothing. There was nothing that that she could have ever found that would have told her. Here's the explanation that will make everything make sense to you. Right, right. You know, I just told my parents um, like last week. Oh, and how did it go? Well, so I was diagnosed a year ago, um, and mm. I have. It, it was a it was an enormous fear of mine because my relationship sure. with them has you know been jagged over the years mm. and I was really terrified and I texted the producers I was like I can't do it like I just can't I can't tell them uh, like yeah. I can't I don't know how to do it I don't know how, I don't have the words like I don't have that relationship mm. with them I I don't want to feel vulnerable around them I don't feel safe around them mm. and then. You know, I, f- I feel like there's a part when you're telling, you know, your your family, depending on the relationship you have with them, that, like, you are indicting them in some way right. that they were bad parents or something like that. And that was absolutely not what I wanted to do because even if I had issues with parts of their parenting, what I know to be true is that autism was absolutely no. not talked about in America <laughs> no. in in those times and certainly not with girls who yeah, are high achieving. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering, you know, as you were talking before, one thing I've been kind of grappling with or one thing that sort of led me to this, there was a particular incident that kept coming up for mm. me in, in therapy, like an incident that happened to me when I was a kid mm. that I feel like sort of set in motion a lot of ways I felt about myself or right. whatever. And I wonder sort of how it impacted you as a child or if you can think mm. about how it impacted you to be sort of, you know, the naughty one, the difficult one. Like, how did oh, it make yeah. you feel about yourself oh, as an adult or as a... <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, absolutely yeah. terrible. I mean, I I felt, I mean, I, you know, I I felt different, but also I felt like somebody who was less good. I mean, I don't mean like good at stuff. I mean, good hearted mm-hmm. than other people. Yeah. Because I'd I'd been told often that I was like arrogant or aloof or abrupt or mm-hmm. um like my mum's phrase about me was always that I didn't suffer fools gladly, which <laughs> may be true. <laughs> like I, I was not, you know, front of the line when patience was handed out. <laughs> um but, but you, you get this really direct feedback about yourself that 
is always couched in negative terms. And then you get the yeah. indirect feedback, you know, that you're not invited to parties, that, you know, the other girls are, yeah. you know, they're getting together and they have interests that they share and, and you can't access them. They don't make any sense to you. And you feel rejected. And, and yeah, like my self-esteem was horrible. And, and when I had a when I had a complete breakdown when I was 17 and I you know, had to come out of school mm. for a year and I, I just absolutely couldn't function. It was following mm-hmm. like a, an instant where I'd been bullied by some other girls um, over some stupid mm-hmm. school magazine that, you know, we'd all supposed to be working on. And I'd, you know, I'd come off wrong, like I'd I'd upset everybody and it tipped over mm-hmm. into me being like singled out and targeted over and over again. And my self-esteem mm. was always, you know, it was already so low. I couldn't handle it anymore. Mm. Like I absolutely hated myself and I was suicidal and I was suicidal for a long, long time. Oh. Yeah. And it's, you know, yeah. I'm I'm yeah. saying that really openly because I know exactly how common that is amongst, mm. you know, autistic people, whether or not they know it. It's it's that continual rejection that breaks you down. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know. As you're talking, I'm thinking that the saving grace that I had was sport. Um, oh, and I was I was very good at sports, but also that was where you could find worth right. because it was very black and white. You either win or you lose. Yeah, yeah. And you can always keep improving. And you could always get positive attention because if you won, right. you it just comes with the territory. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um but my, I remember my coach very clearly saying to me one year in college, like, you seek out negative attention. And I was like, I don't know what you mean. Mm. And I was thinking like, oh, that's <laughs> because for so much of the time in in school, that's the only attention that you got. It's negative. You know, that's the only attention that I got was negative attention. Yeah. And the only way that people would pay attention to you, you know, is like – for being naughty, yeah. you know, yeah, no, that exactly. that um you're not getting the attention for the things that you feel you should be, which is like mm. you're smart or you're clever or you're interesting or you're interested in this thing or whatever. It's like, yeah. oh, you're you don't suffer fools. Like that, like the narrative okay. in your own family of origin is like, you know, mine was like, oh, I'm loud and obnoxious. Mm. And it's like, oh, well. I'm other things too, but, guys. But also, like, the, <laughs> I always found that I was I was not aiming for that at all. You know, like I was going out there trying to mm-hmm. be really charming and lively and fun, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. that would get read as obnoxious and overbearing and yeah, loud or whatever, erratic. I don't know. Right. And you'd be like, well, how how do I bridge that gap between how I'm trying to behave and how it's always received? And I. I actually still feel like that quite often now. I still sometimes get oh, reactions sure. and I think, wow, that is that is not how I read this situation. Um, <laughs> that, is, that is not, yeah. And, but I, I remember my careers teacher, like I, we'd filled in a questionnaire and I'd ticked, you know, always tries to please people. And she, you know, in front of the whole class said, I would not have had you down as someone that was trying to do that, Catherine. Like I always thought, you know, you were deliberately trying yes. to be different. And, yes. and it was like, Oh God, that was, I, and it was devastating. I felt really yes. wounded by that, you know, <laughs> this idea that I was deliberately trying to right. annoy them all. But then I, you know, I think that's people's way of right. putting it on you rather than them. Like you have tried to upset them rather than them not accepting you being a, a bit different to, to the mainstream. I mean, I don't know about you, but getting my diagnosis and understanding more about myself has has made me more generous to other people because actually I Mm -hmm. have made some of the same assumptions in the past. And I I would be lying if I said that I've always been saintly about it. And, you know, like now I'm much more likely than I was previously to think, okay, Lauren's talking really loudly. Um, Is it maybe she has a hearing difficulty? Maybe she's really excited. Maybe she's neurodivergent (laughs) like me. You know, maybe... You know, maybe she's had quite a lot of coffee. I'm not going to judge it. And it's it's actually really easy to to step back and to decenter yourself from it. Like, this is not about Lauren attacking right. me. This is about Lauren being something that I wasn't quite expecting. But OK, let's go with that. I mean, it, it's actually quite simple right. when you start to practice it. But it you know, takes a bit to get right. there. Right. There's some amount of 
grace, I think, that can kind of come, not just towards the world around you, but also to yourself. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, did you find after the diagnosis, like you were gentler, kinder, mm. you know, more forgiving with yourself? Oh, absolutely. And I always say that, you know, wintering is the book that I could only write after I'd gone through the, mm. the period of discovery that I, I document in electricity because, yeah, like reevaluating myself through kinder eyes was I mean absolutely life-changing and it meant that a I stopped thinking that I was a terrible person and I, I started having an explanation for the times when I like failed in public or whatever but also mm -hmm. that I could just start adapting to meet my own needs and that quite often when stuff went really badly for me I could see that it was because I'd pushed myself past what was comfortable or what was manageable mm. for me you know like I'd put myself in a very noisy environment or I'd worked for too long and and had too many conversations in the day or there was one incident that I keep remembering where I lost my temper at work mm -hmm. and at the time I had a really itchy label in the back of my dress <laughs> and I'd always yeah because that's huge when you're autistic know, you know, know. it's it sounds tiny, but it's massive. And I remember being in this quite tense conversation and feeling this label and feeling this label and feeling this label. And it felt like it was burning through my skin. And I reached back. And as I was talking, I ripped it out of my dress <laughs> at, at just at the time when I was like offending someone. And it, it was this moment of this complete loss of control that I felt so humiliated for afterwards because it looked like I'd got so angry. I'd torn my clothing <laughs> And it was actually the other way around that I was so overwhelmed by the this really, really itchy label that I couldn't control. I couldn't self-regulate. And that's I mean, that's such a distillation of what it is to be autistic, like losing yes. your self-regulation because you're totally overwhelmed by something that other people will think is minute. Exactly. Um, and like getting my diagnosis, that was the thing. That was one of the first things that I kept going back to that moment. It was so telling for me suddenly. But as I got older, I got better at suppressing those dysregulated moments. But it meant that I got sick instead, you know, so it meant that I would mm. suddenly get an absolutely terrible headache or I would have to take yes. to my bed the next day or, you know, like it, it, it internalized it. And of course, it affected my mental health very badly. So you, mm -hmm. you kind of don't win either way until you're able to take control of your own self-regulation, really. And that's, that's right, a game changer. Right. But yeah, it's, right. I look back on some moments in my life and I think I understand that now. But wow, I was as baffled as everyone else was by that behavior in that moment. I didn't have any way of explaining it. Right, right. I think for, for, you know, when I started thinking about autism, I was like, my gosh, if I do an accounting of all of the outsized reactions mm. that I've had to things, mm. it, it, it should have been obvious. But no one thinks of it as you have it big feelings or yes, you have yeah. that that you have a, a challenge regulating your big feelings. Mm. It's that like you're being obstreperous. Yes. That you're being difficult um or you know recalcitrant or whatever. It's just like it's always on a on on you mm. as opposed to, you know, having some empathy around like, okay, clearly this isn't typical behavior. And so this yes. person is clearly yeah. going through something. And it's yeah. interesting. I mean, do you find that now that you have been diagnosed, you've been public about your diagnosis, that mm. people around you are like, oh, okay, I get it now. Or are they <laughs> yeah. still like, like, what is her problem? Mm, I mean, half and half, honestly. And I think a lot depends on the individual's understanding of autism, you know, because mm -hmm. for some people, it makes them really angry because as far as they're concerned, what autism is, is like a non-speaking child who they would consider to be like intellectually disabled and like unable to, to communicate or to do any work. And, you know, like that's a it's an inaccurate understanding of autism for so many reasons anyway. Mm -hmm. But what they, you know, so so then when they hear me say I'm autistic, they think it's some bizarre play for attention and, you know, yes. find it offensive almost, you know, like I'm trying to steal oxygen from yes. people who need it. 
Right, right. I mean, I've I've noticed that like so I mean, I had the experience of coming out as as gay and yeah, you've come it was out twice. pretty it was pretty easy. Well, it was pretty easy. I mean, except with my parents like when I told my mom that I was gay, she said whatever. And that wasn't <laughs> like the best response, but everybody generally in my life has been like fine. I mean, my brother like I told my brother first like he doesn't care, like my parents just generally like and friends, I mean, whatever. Now my m- most of my friends are queer people or queer adjacent people, you know? And so it's not a big deal. But I think that, but, and, but everybody knows what it means to be gay. If you say I'm gay, people get it. I mean, people don't know what it means to be autistic, but I wonder like how you have both dealt with, you know, your own personal revelation and your own personal truth, but then also educating people about what that means more globally. Yeah. You know, I mean, It's such a massive issue because, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like if you say you're gay, people understand what gay means. If you say you have schizophrenia, there's a stable definition of that. But with autism, Mm -hmm. there isn't even a stable definition in the psychological literature at the moment. I mean, it's not even just like that folk understanding diverges from you know, medical understanding or psychiatric understanding or psychological understanding or how you want to put it. It's that actually, if you ask people working in the field at the moment, they feel like the definition is thrown up in the air as well, because they're under, beginning to understand mm-hmm. that they were working on the wrong paradigms before. And they were working on these, you know, external observation modalities that were based mm. on, you know, like the research was done on eight year old white boys, middle class boys in particular right. as well. And the assumption was they were likely to be nonverbal. And mm. it's so it's so hard to be part of remaking that definition because I I do feel like I'm part of of that in a very kind of crowdsourced way Mm -hmm. um and so Mm -hmm. I mean like I would love to say that I'm going out there boldly and explaining my autism to everyone but I still mask it a lot in situations where it doesn't feel safe and where I can't yeah you know can't trust that understanding to be there right but I have been I mean I've been working on a page on my website recently I thought about it and I thought I need to write my own definition of autism as I understand it right now, because there's no one source that I can even turn to to quote. And and that's where we are right now. And I, it's a it's a difficult place to be, but it's also quite an exciting place to be. You know, mm. the, the debate mm-hmm. is is happening. And, and finally, we are we are being part of that debate and mm-hmm. yeah there's we're learning and it's you know what we understand as autism now will not be the same in 20 years time we need to right. know that you know we need to know that we do not fully get this yet and there's much more to discover and there's much more to pin down and to unpick um right and so yeah I think sometimes I do sit down and explain to people but I do find it exhausting and I am increasingly kind to myself about not feeling like I've got to be responsible for every ignorant person's <laughs> understanding of, of what autism is, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I also right. wanted to contribute my own definition as I understand it at the moment. And to, you know, like I equally feel compassion for people who have come in, have stumbled into this world and don't understand it. So where does that leave them? Like, how can I help them to come to a more generous realization about what autism actually is? Mm -hmm. It's it's so tricky. That's a lot. Mm. That's very, that's a lot of weight because it's hard because, I mean, I know this, I keep comparing it to like gayness or whatever, but in the early days, like, I mean, in probably like 2000, you know, when I was in a workplace Mm. and I people knew that I was gay, like the comments that I would get would be like shocking. Even then, even like just 20 years ago, like, you know, people just were so weird. And and Mm, I thought, mm. you know, is it my job to to educate them, fix your homophobia? Like, is it my job or can I just like live my life? Can I just like, can I just show up as my authentic self and in that way, that is my advocacy. In that way, that is the way that I'm helping is by 
just being open about who I am, but not having to like fix everyone else. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, it yeah. feels I mean, really tricky. It is tricky. And I, you know, like, I think you have to remind yourself that you are not the homophobe whisperer. Like it's not your job to coax them into. I, I wish I was. <laughs> yeah. I wish I was the homophobe puncher. I wish I was yeah. the homophobe kicker, you know? Um, but yeah, no, you, no, you it's true. Yeah. That. It's too much. But like, I also, so yeah, so I let myself off and I I try and be part of the bigger debate rather than the micro debate because it's those micro debates that are mm. so exhausting. But I right. also, um, well, I suppose two things. One is that I uh, refuse to do press that is going to be about, you know, like challenging my right to exist, you know, and I won't do oh. <laughs> press with people who are anti-vaxxers for example because yeah in a very totally. real sense they want me eradicated from the gene pool and I am not I don't have yeah. to sit at a table with those people it's not reasonable for my mental health to do that but yeah. I also flip it back on myself a little and try and remind myself of the gaps in my knowledge and understanding you know like Absolutely. Yeah. Do I understand what it is to be black and autistic? You know, do I understand what mm. it is to be trans and autistic? That's a that's a really mm. common combination. Yeah, do I understand yeah. what it is to be nonverbal autistic? You know, so I mm -hmm. I try and remind myself of the ways that I need to listen harder to in the way that I want people to listen to me. Right, right. Well, I've been sort of thinking a lot about my own ableism and how in my mind, like when I was first thinking about autism, I was like, I can't be autistic. I own a home and I have a house. Yes. Yeah, or I, yeah. I own a yeah, home yeah. and I have a job and like I have a partner and like I'm totally normal. And it's like, why do you think that those things don't go along with a disability? Like, what are you? And I think you're right. It's like the combinations and the intersectionality of all of this is, you know, much more complicated than, you know, just some 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 white ladies who think differently. Yeah, no, you know? I, that's so, like, so true. And not to minimize, yeah. not to minimize. But, but, but we it, can it's... do this in relative safety, right? We can have these conversations because of the yes. kind of jobs that we're in and because we're white and, you know, because we're relatively middle class or what, you know, whatever it is, like it, it's, it's a privilege to be able to have these conversations and other people out there wouldn't feel safe to do this, you know, and, and that's... yes. That's something that I think we often need to bear in mind because I, I think it's really easy for us to erase other other people within this very, very fragile community. And I'm, I'm you know, I haven't always been as conscious of that as I am at this point. And I hope I get more conscious about it as I as I go along. Right. I, I learned I mean, I learned so many things from your book, but one thing was the Maori word for autism, mm -hmm. Takiwatanga. Yeah. The the idea of your own time and space. Um, mm. And, you know, and you, you have this, like, you have this beautiful line that, like, you yearn for that place, you know, without mm. having ever known it yourself. And, like, can you get there at this point mm. in your life? Can you find your own time and space now? Or is it too late? Yeah. And I wonder if you've, you've answered mm. that for yourself. Mm, a little more yeah and I think I am beginning it's you know like it, it's almost a bit like learning to take up the space that you need like it all comes together for me into this idea that I need to be allowed to take up my shape of space in the world and that might be a different shape to other people's and I'm getting mm -hmm. better at it and I mm -hmm. Like I have to enter into it quite mindfully to remind myself of what I feel like I need, because having suppressed it for so long, I'm not always aware of it myself, you know, and I feel like I'm growing into it and I feel like I'm making more and more changes to my life that mean I can live in exactly the way that I want to and, and need to. But it's mm -hmm. definitely a work in progress and it, mm -hmm. I think it will be forever. What are those changes? I'm curious. Well, you know, I stopped I stopped working in the university that I was working in when I was um, writing electricity. And I began to think about how I wanted to shape my days and how often I wanted to be in silence, how often I wanted to walk and get outside. 
like how often I wanted to actually socialize what the balance was in in the way that I even practiced my writing you know because for me it's not all about output it's about the pleasure of obsessing over certain things and and inputting and sort of drinking in information in that very autistic information hungry Mm -hmm. way um (laughs) but you know also I I increasingly try and explain what I need in the moment to people you know and say I'm finding this really noisy right now I'm really sorry I'm going to have to step outside or would you mind turning it down or you know whatever that that particular issue is at the time and I I am getting better at just trying to simply state my needs um but it it's very Mm -hmm. imperfect still and I still regularly find myself suppressing that need because you know out of sheer embarrassment or politeness or yes yeah the embarrassment (laughs) I mean or or like somebody else is going to be put out I mean I remember one time a lady was, like, bouncing her foot up and down on this chair, like, the leg of a chair, and the chair leg was broken, and it was making Mm. terrible, terrible scratching noises, but she couldn't hear it because she had her headphones in. And so I thought it was totally reasonable to just go over and be like, hey, I'm I'm not sure if you know, but uh, the chair's broken, and it's making this noise, and she looked Uh, at me like I had five eyeballs, (laughs) and she was like... She was basically like with her eye, eyes saying like, go back to your seat right now. <laughs> and so I'm, I've, you know, I feel like I've, I'm getting to this point where I'm there. There's a lot of work to just like mm. one, recognize the trigger and two, fix it for yourself because there is embarrassment because people don't know. I mean, I often think like, if I get on an airplane and I get put on a window seat, which I can't sit mm-hmm. in, and I say to the th- flight attendant, like in my in in my fantasy autism land, I say to the flight attendant, I'm not going to be able to sit there because I'm autistic and I have extreme panic around right. these particular spaces. <laughs> yeah. And if you could just move me to an aisle. And she would say, oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm so happy to help you. But back in the real world. <laughs> um, right, right. And so one episode is that autism fantasy land? Like, what would your autistic fantasy land look oh, like man. where, like, you could move through your day yeah. without any hitches of any kind? Like, for Catherine, what would it look oh, like? Like, everywhere would be quiet. Nobody would be wearing strong perfume. Nobody would touch me, like, barge into me in the street <laughs> or, like, tap me on the shoulder to get my attention or, oh, I hate that. <laughs> But actually, it would probably mostly take place in a cabin in the woods completely on my own. <laughs> so, you know, but I, like, I, it's really interesting you raise that because I do think that within the autistic community, we can like get into the headspace of thinking that that world is possible. You know, like if only the world would adapt to us. And I, I right. think we have to question that a little bit because I think there's like a halfway point that we need to find. So, I mean, you're you're some years out from your diagnosis. Mm. I'm like one year yeah. out. I wonder, like, where where, where you are now. Mm. You've written a book. You've you've processed. You've written two books. You had a massive hit. Uh, you know, which might not have anything <laughs> to do with you know autism, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. it probably changed a lot of things for you. Um, but yeah. like, where are you now? Well, I mean, I think like one of the things is I'm kind of post obsession with it. Like I've I've absorbed mm. a lot about it and the, the obsession with it has waned. Like I've, I've kind of I've got to the point where I just want to live as the person I am um, and not have to constantly reflect on it. And every now and then I'm reminded of my differences in a way that really surprises me. Like I I've made so many changes to my life now that it's often invisible to me that I am, you know, different in any way at all. Like I don't have to bang my head up Mm -hmm. against it every day like I used to. And every now and Mm. then, like my level of sort of disability in the world really shocks me. I'm kind of really confronted by it. And I I find Mm. it almost quite upsetting all over again, you know, (laughs) like, Mm -hmm. oh, wow, I, Mm -hmm. I can't deal with this. Oh God, you know, I I thought I was kind of fine forever now, <laughs> um, <laughs> and that like in lots of ways that's kind of a nice place to be. It's nicer than it sounds because it means that most of the time things are working, 
you know, I have to really remind myself that I am in need of, of support sometimes and that I deserve to access it. Um, electricity came out in the UK, I think, 2018, so nearly four years ago. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's been quite strange to return to talking to it now that the US edition has been released because I I felt almost bodily reluctant to to return to talking about that stuff, if I'm honest. It felt kind of exhausting to to trawl back there and, and my my brain was very reluctant to go there. But it's actually been really mm-hmm. good for me to start talking about it again. And like that feeling of how far you've traveled and that feeling of changes that you've cemented into you that you mm-hmm. hadn't noticed even happening. Um, and the feeling that mm-hmm. you have something to pass on to the next generation of people coming through. I think that's that's a really wonderful place to be, actually. So, yeah, I'm I'm proudly and happily autistic and I don't have the doubts that I once had of the imposter syndrome, certainly. Catherine May is the New York Times bestselling author of Wintering, The Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times and The Electricity of Every Living Thing, A Woman's Walk in the Wild to Find Her Way Home. She lives in Whitstable on the Kentish coast of England. You can find her online at katherine-may.co.uk. This episode was produced by David Ja and edited by Sophie Crane. Mix engineering by Jake Gorski. Special thanks to Lisa Dunn for booking help. And thanks to you, friend, for listening.